Ladies and gentlemen, so happy to have this next guest back on the show, man. He is one of my favorite fighters from my original home state of Michigan, the place with the best people in the world. Uh, we are talking about the number nine ranked UFC bantamweight contender, Mr. Wonderful, they call him, Mr. Cody Stamen. Welcome to the show, Cody. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I thought of something great here. You gotta, you'll gotta, you tell me by your reaction, but I, I hear that most people are looking for... Uh, the next fight that you have coming up in a couple weeks for you to uh, knock out a song. I got a hashtag beat you down. <laughs> you got it. Exactly. That's what it is. Ladies and gentlemen, he is going up against song you dong. And when I said knock out a song, he got to beat you dong. That's it. <laughs> I like it. Michigan people have a sense of humor. I knew that wouldn't go over his head. And it's funny too, because, if you're thinking about like I could have said like break out a song, but knock out a song is even better. But uh, <laughs> this is it. Beat me a dong, exactly. He is a tough guy though, man. Song Ya Dong is a guy. Very tough. Yeah, he is. He is right. What? Maybe one or two spots below you. Got to be pretty close, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. He's. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're uh, as far as I'm mean, not look at the rankings. I look at it. You know, if if you're anywhere ranked in the top 15, you're a, uh, you're a world-class competitor. I mean, you don't get there by accident. Uh, yeah. He didn't get there by accident. He's uh, definitely one of the tougher guys I think I've ever fought. Um, you know, he's got great boxing. Yep. Uh, very powerful, explosive dude. You can tell, uh, and he's very well trained, um, you know, and I'm looking forward to, to whooping his ass. Absolutely. I think that's what, exactly what's going to happen. And that is November 16th in Washington, DC. Is that right? Or 9th? December 7th. December 7th, that's right. We are yep. still about four and a half weeks away. So uh, you are probably just a couple weeks into training camp. How's it going? Uh, training camp's been great. So I'm doing my training camp in Las Vegas, Nevada. So I'm utilizing the UFC Performance Institute. Um, and that's been kind of a game changer for me. Just having all the resources that they have available um, just to kind of add to, you know, kind of what I already know that works. Um, it's just, it's, it's been so vital and, and it's helped me so much, um, you know, with my weight, uh, with my strength conditioning, you know, everything, you know, it's really a world-class facility and, uh, I'm pretty fortunate that I get to use it and, uh, learn from some of the best in their respective fields. Absolutely. And I like that you spelled out uh, the name. A lot of people yell out really quick, UFC PI, UFC PI, and they say it so fast. I think a lot of people watching shows don't know what that means or what that yeah, is. Yeah, probably have no, no idea what they're talking about. Right? right, right. So the UFC PI that you hear a lot of people yell out is the UFC Performance Institute, and it's an amazing mm -hmm. place. And do you, can you bring some of your guys from the Michigan top team there, or it's a situation where you have to train with whoever's local in Vegas when you yeah, so I've had I've had uh, I've had a few guys from Michigan top team out. Like currently, I have uh, TJ and Tony Laramie, um, and they're they're staying with me. They're a couple up and coming guys from actually Windsor, um, Windsor, Canada. Yep. Um, very very tough uh, young prospects, young. Uh, you know they're they're great training partners. Uh, they're fighting December sixth in Windsor. So um, you know we're all in training camp. We're all staying uh, at my house out here in Vegas and. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, we're uh, we're all we're all enjoying ourselves, and you know, we're getting a lot of work done. Absolutely. And uh, is this going to be the first time that you will be in our nation's capital? Yeah, first time, first time in DC. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It should be pretty cool. I uh, I like to you know get out and sightsee a little bit. You know, on fight week, just because uh, there's not a lot to do outside of you know media and cutting weight. It's a good distraction. So uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cool stuff you can go and see in DC. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And the good thing also is that for those of you that say be careful about the dangerous neighborhoods, you just got to say I'm from Detroit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I know about that. Be careful, See right? That? <laughs> yeah, that's that? it. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Like they said, you can take you can take the guy out of Detroit, but you can't take Detroit out of the guy, right? That's right. That's right. We carry guns where I'm from, so we're not we're not really scared of anybody. Nope, exactly, man. So many great celebrities from Detroit too. Eminem, and you have yeah. Kid Rock. You know one of the cool. Yeah. You know one of the coolest stories I heard from Kid Rock. This is like years ago when he first got to be big. Someone, uh, someone found that he in the winter was in the winter was doing figure eights in the guy's yard on his driveway in his grass, and he came out getting ready to scream and his head off. Kid Rock stumps out and he goes, "Hey, I'm gonna write you a check right now. How, how about fifty thousand dollars or something?" Oh my God! Yeah, the guy's like, "Oh, all right, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> finish, yeah, uh, fin care. yeah, finish doing the figure eights." 
uh, Mr. You. Rock, yeah, you know, all right, because you know he got he he got out of hand driving off the street, but he was gonna pay for it right there. And you know, I remember also remember uh, insane clown posse. Yeah, those guys were drinking the Fago. Remember the Fago soda over there? Detroit native zone. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, man. I still remember that man, that rock and rye. I don't know. We're not sponsored by Fago, but we should be. But Michigan, yeah, exactly. yeah in Michigan, soda is the best. And in Michigan, the water is great out of the faucet the guys yep. are the coolest the girls are awesome michigan is there's a no, great place right outside of the the weather there's really nothing bad about michigan and right you know the winter the winter makes you appreciate the summer that much yeah. more yeah and uh you know the hunting the outdoorsy stuff that i really enjoy uh michigan's great for that without um, a doubt so i'm definitely uh, i'm definitely missing home being out here in las vegas but that's just not bad either it's a pretty cool place to live yeah, without a doubt. Do you have a lot of experience going to Las Vegas? I think you fought there before a couple of times at least, right? Uh, four times. Nice. How's your four. luck? How's your luck in Vegas? Oh, I'm undefeated in Vegas. I love it. I love it. And I've, I'm, made a lot, I've made a lot of money in the city, so I'm looking forward to making a little bit more December 7th. Absolutely. And what do you think about this matchup against Song Yudong? In fact, let me ask you this. A lot of people say, you know, we're watching tape on someone, and, and I've heard people say, do you watch tape on someone? Do you use what you see? Does it matter, this and that? But I've never heard anyone ask a fighter, what is it you're looking for when you're watching tape? And I know that if, you have, if anything is a secret, you don't want to disclose, that's fine. But what can you tell well, us about when you're watching someone that you're going to fight that you're looking for in, in, the, in the different clips of different fights of theirs? And how far back yeah. do you go? With I'm curious. I, I'm curious. I'm curious to see. Uh, well, I, I go back. I, I watch every piece of film that I can. Uh, I enjoy watching film. Um, I kind of like to. I like to know what, how guys react to certain situations. I mean, that's really what you're looking for. You kind of you want to see. You know, at one point, does he do? Uh, you know, what move? And there's always. Everybody has tendencies, right? I do. Everyone does. Um, and it, it's kind of our job at this level. Everyone's good, you know. Every single guy I fight from now until uh, the time I'm done fighting, they're going to be tough. They're going to be world class. Uh, I've just I've worked hard and I've, I've made it to this this elite level. So every single guy I fight is going to be really good. So what the difference between you know winning and losing at this level? I believe you know one coming in in shape and two uh, making the reads early in fights. And a lot of that you can do in film. You know, guys are going to consistently do the same thing throughout their career. And you can kind of get an idea of like how they like to fight. And then you have to figure out, you know, before the fight and then in the in the cage, you have to implement your game plan. And that's, you know, one of the things that I think I do extremely well in comparison to other guys is that I can uh, adjust my style to, you know, really whatever opponent I face. If you notice, I don't really ever fight anyone the same way. Um, you know, like Alejandro Perez, my last fight, you know, I got that fight on three weeks notice. And so I... I basically needed to, to fake and faint and like scare him into thinking that I was constantly going to be growing and kind of just shutting down his offense with fakes and faints because I didn't have the the, the eight week training camp to prepare um, and the game plan you know I executed it uh, perfectly and it, it worked out you know I ended up beating a guy that hadn't lost in, in five years he was the Ultimate Fighter champ um, so at this level I think the what separates me from the pack is is just my unique ability to to dissect what people do and then go into the cage and kind of execute my game plan um, to a T. And if I can do that and I can do that against the song Dong and I will, uh, I think I'll, I'll actually piece him apart. I think that I'm a lot more experienced than he is um, in certain situations. You know, I think that he's kind of an unknown. He's definitely a, a, a raw talent, but I think he's still pretty young and I'm not sure that he's ready for a cerebral athlete like me. Uh, standing across from him. Absolutely well stated. Now, does having a coach watch film with you help at all, or do you feel like I already know what I'm looking to see? I don't, I'm not really needing a coach. Looking absolutely, at absolutely. I mean, any everyone has a unique. That thing about fighting is so subjective that what you see and what I see are two totally, totally different things. You know, and that's why uh, you know judging is such a hard thing because you know everyone is looking for different things. You know, if, if if you're uh, if you're in love with a leg kick, every single time someone throws a leg kick, you notice that. Um, so uh, you want to get as many different perspectives as you can because everyone, you know, uh, actually my my mom of all people, um, she you know she found out. You know, obviously my parents are huge huge fans, mm -hmm. um, and 
So my parents were watching uh, your song down the fight. And she she noticed something, and I'm not going to say what it is, but she noticed something that uh, none of my coaches, none of my training partners, and everyone that's watched been with me, no one noticed this. And this is this specific tell. And of all people, my mom found this out. She saw this, and I was like, oh, my God, you're right. This is so obvious, but I just I didn't see it. So I'm, I think that, um, you know, that everyone sees a fight differently, and everyone sees different things. Um, and so for me, you know, I'm, uh, you know, part of being a martial artist is just keeping your mind open and, uh, you know, learning something from everything, everyone. And, and surprisingly, uh, you know, my mom came through on, on this occasion and actually showed me something. I think it's going to be helpful in the fight. That is really cool. And it is it's nice. Crazy. Yeah. It's awesome that she is caring enough to actually look at the fights and do that. Cause there are some moms that are supportive, but they won't sit down and watch a fight, uh, unless it's with you. And maybe they'll watch it while they're making a, a pie or something like that, you know. But it's something. My, like you're, you're... my mom, uh, my mom, she, she'd like to say that she raised she raised men. She uh, she made us. She wasn't uh, soft and cuddly, uh, you know, comforting. Obviously, she's a, she's an absolute great mom. But you know, she raised us to be men, and uh, you know, so there's nothing. My mom, my mom, uh, she'll watch fights. She'll. Uh, you know, she'll go to practice. There's nothing, uh, you know, that there's no, there's no part of the game that, that she's not supportive in. That's really cool. Can 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 she make it out to the fight in D.C. or is that going to not? Oh, of course, oh, of course. I'll fly my parents out there. They'll be there. They're there uh, every fight. That's awesome. That's really really cool. So, yeah, um, family will be there. That's really cool. It's important. That support means a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it helps to remind you, uh, you know, what you're fighting for. Yeah, absolutely. So. So uh, this is going to be what your your sixth or seventh UFC fight? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually not even sure. Six yeah. or seven. I like that. So you're definitely getting uh, you're definitely getting your feet wet. Was there an adrenaline dump in the first fight or the first couple fights? What is the UFC jitters? I mean, no one, I guess, loves to say, "Oh man, I'm jittery. I was scared shitless, this or that." But I think it's kind of a real thing coming on the big stage, and a lot of people say, "I got it all out of my system in the first fight." But a lot of people say. It's crazy every time you go in there and there's all these fans. Is that something that now that you've gotten several fights in that is even more of kind of, it's more of a comfort zone feeling like it's your house in there? And if so, when did that happen? So, I mean, there was never a transition period in the UFC where I felt like I was finally comfortable. I think that what you need to get comfortable with is the level of opponent that you're facing. You know, uh, guys in the UFC are just, they're the, the best. They're handpicked all the way around the world. Um, so you're when you go to the UFC, you're gonna face someone that that isn't like the guys that you were facing on the regional scene. These guys are a lot better. They're uh, you know they have other resources that you do. They're training full time. This isn't a part time gig for for guys in the UFC. You know everyone is really really good, and there's a pace and there's a grind inside the cage, and there's a savviness uh, to opponents in the cages you're gonna see in the UFC. And that was what was different. You know I, I think that. Um, my amateur career, I had 20 amateur fights. Um, when I got to the UFC, I was 14 to one. So I had plenty of experience going in the cage. So I knew how to handle the jitters and the nerves that you would uh, expect um, from any fight, not just a UFC fight, you know, because anytime you're getting locked in the cage, whether it's in the UFC or in your backyard, um, it's dangerous and it's scary. And, it, and, and every single fighter will tell you that. There's, there's a certain amount of nerves that anytime you're going to face somebody that, you know, potentially hurt you, like you're, you're scared. It's just, it's human nature. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, um, it was just adjusting, adjusting to the level of competition. Um, that was something that took me a few fights. Um, and it's something that maybe I've just now adjusted to. And I've just now kind of gotten comfortable with um, in maybe my last couple of UFC fights. Uh, and then, you know, having to deal with the media, uh, different amounts of attention. Um, those are things that are, that are different and things that you need to get used to. Uh, but, you know, I, none of that stuff really, really... Uh, uh, rough with my feathers you know when I actually really get the most nervous is when I get the contract in my email because that's when that's when you know things become real you sign the contract all right you're fighting this person on this date and now you need to plan the next two months and lay everything out get everything taken care of um you know to be successful so that's really where I get nervous it's just, it's a planning my fight camp stage that really really kind of kind of makes me nervous because there's a lot of things that you can do right and wrong so if you do, if you you know, if you're planning, your preparation aren't where they need to be, you know, your performance is obviously going to suffer. So that's really what I focus on. And, you know, by the time the fight rolls around, I've already trained so much. I've already done so much. Um, I'm not nervous anymore. I'm just ready to get it over with. You know, you, when you 
you're in a fight camp, you're basically, you know, 24 seven, your whole life revolves around training and recovering, training and recovering. There's really nothing else. I mean, obviously, you know, you can get out and do this and that, but your mind's always on the fight. So you, you never really, you never get an opportunity to really rest your mind, um, you know, leading up to a fight. So by the time a fight rolls around, like when I'm in the back, in the back, you know, two hours before my fight, you know, you, you get to the UFC, you get to any kind of a, you know, event center, cameras in your face. Like at that point, I'm just so ready to just get in the cage and fight. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking about nerves or, or what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm just there and I'm just ready to fight. Makes sense. Very, very well stated. You know, I've been a fight fan for many, many, many years. I've never been a professional Me fighter. Too. Yeah, yeah. You, I can imagine you have, and you're a professional fighter, so you know your stuff, and I appreciate that. But so I, I always try to throw that disclaimer out, trying to say that you know I don't have the experience of being a professional fighter, but a longtime fight fan, always competed, competed in jujitsu, didn't wrestle, wish I would have, but was always into sports and everything. And and but in fighting, I've been watching for many years. I remember hearing a couple of experts saying that one of the things that differentiates the best fighters from the rest is their ability to adjust and mm -hmm. right and he said that for some reason in the heat of battle whether you're whether you're really doing poorly or whether you're just maybe kind of going even with your opponent and it's just kind of maybe you're wanting to start you know you know dominating the ability in the heat of battle to to go to your corner and hear this and hear some things that you got to change you got to stop doing this you got to stop doing that you got to start doing this you got to start doing that i think it's really hard for most people to do and i think the more cerebral fighters like yourself can do that is that something that 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 you're really aware of and and i know that that it's not as easy as it sounds because if a fighter that you're fighting your opponent is really good He's yeah. doing something that's kind of, in a way, stopping you from adjusting. But how do you look at that, and why is it that it seems like you don't frequently see a lot of fighters able to adjust, even if it's just constantly like a stalemate that they're involved with, or if they're getting beat and, and they just come in the next round hearing all this and go back and do the exact same thing they did the previous round? So I think there's there's two reasons to answer your question. And I think there's two reasons um, that a guy can't make those in-fight adjustments. One is because he's he's a he's kind of a fixed fighter. He fights a certain way every fight. Um, you know, he, he's not going to come out and surprise you and, and just completely change his game plan. You know, you get like a Khabib. Khabib yep. is a great example. Yep. Khabib is going to walk you down, take you down, get on top of you, and just beat you senseless. He does it every fight. Um, it's what he does. There's no you know, if, if Khabib couldn't get a takedown, he couldn't go to game plan number two where, you know, he stands on his feet and, you know, throws kicks and, and punches and becomes a kickboxer. Right. He just doesn't have that ability. He's so fixed on that one. And don't get me wrong, I mean, he's the absolute best in the world at it. And, and no one's ever done what he can do. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bad mouth and I'm, no. I'm a huge fan of Khabib. But sure. that is who he is and that's how he's going to fight. So I think there's, there's a lot of guys like that. There's certain guys that just, they kickbox a certain way, they wrestle a certain way. That's how they fight. You know what you're getting when you go into that fight. Um, and then there's other guys, guys that have have trained, you know, a bunch of different martial arts. You know, can can kick, can punch, can wrestle, can can do jujitsu, and um, are mindful of what's going on in the fight. And I think that's where you know where I fall into place is that um, I can fight at different ranges. I can throw kicks like a karate guy. I can throw kicks like a Muay Thai guy. I can box. I can wrestle. Um, and I'm not saying that <clears throat> not everyone can do this, but I can throw a kick three different ways um, just because I've learned so many, you know, and studied so many different martial arts. Uh, I think that I have just a little bit more, a few more weapons in the, in the arsenal than maybe guys that uh, are more of a, a fixed fighting style. So, you know, if, if I'm in a fight, uh, you know, I go back to my corner after a round and whatever I was doing, if I was fighting flat footed and trying to box and, you know, I was getting beat at that, uh, you know, I can sit down in the, in the, in the corner and take that one minute and realize, Hey, you know, Every time I did this, I was getting hit, so I'm not going to do that anymore. Instead, I'm going to do this. Um, and you're right; those are the kind of guys that that make it to the you know the very elite level. And you see it happen all the time in championship fights. You see a guy go and just get his get his butt kicked, you know, for for two rounds, and then also in the third round, he comes out with a whole different style, and he just he just starts you know taking the fight away. Um, and that's something that's kind of unique to to MMA, you know, compared to where. In, you know, boxing, you kind of know who's going to win. But in MMA, I mean, it can really be anybody, whoever whoever shows up that day uh, or 
you know, whoever can implement a different, you know, go to plan B and then execute that game plan. Um, so yeah, uh, that is definitely, I think, you know, my strong suit. And if you look at anybody that's in the top two, three, all those guys can do the same thing. All those guys can make those in-fight adjustments, uh, you know, go from a kickboxing fight to, you know, the taking a guy down or grinding him out in a wrestling match, you know, something. Everyone can make those adjustments at the highest level. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very well put. You know, I, I wonder, like, if a coach gives these adjustments, I guess it depends how much trust someone has in their coach and their head corner man. But I wonder what would happen if a coach gave these adjustments to make and the fighter's sitting here thinking, no, man, I, I'm, I'm just about ready with what I'm doing to start dominating. I just, I feel like if yeah. I, you know, what happens when there's that conflict? Do you tend to listen to the coach if you trust him a lot? Or do you actually come back and say, yeah, you know what? I want to do that, but I just, you know, how does that work? Is there ever any conversation with the coach back and forth? If he's saying, I want you to change this and, and let's adjust that. Or do you just say, I'll do it. So, yeah, in, in my, in, in my case, I 100%, I fully trust my coach. I know they want me to win. So I believe that what they're going to tell me is, is, is going to get me to that result. I don't think that, um, you know, a coach would ever say anything uh, that he didn't believe uh, 100% uh, was going to change the outcome of the fight. So if a coach says something, if you're smart, you should sit there and listen, nod your head, uh, you know, analyze what they're saying and, and apply it to your, to your game. Um, but you do see that quite often, actually, in the UFC, too. You'll see a coach say something, and then the, coach, the fighter says, no, blah, blah, it's not working. And, you know, that's just, that's a, it's a kind of a sad, sad thing. I've also heard coaches give bad advice, advice that I wouldn't necessarily right. like or um, uh, understand, like, the reason why they would give that advice. But there's, you know, certain relationships, coaching coaches and, uh, and uh you know, they're athletes that they have, like, I mean, you, when you work with someone as much as, you know, you know, we would work with a coach I and mean, you see these people every day, I mean, you, you build some kind of relationship, you understand, you know, kind of how they, kind of how their mind works. So in a lot of ways, uh, you know, you don't know, like maybe a coach says something that doesn't make any sense to you, but, you know, between in that relationship, it, it, it makes perfect sense to those people. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's another thing. It's pretty subjective. I think it's all, it's all, you know, it depends on the athlete. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also the coach is kind of being able to see what's going on in the broader picture, rather mm -hmm. where the fighter is just seeing the other guy, the opponent, where, you know, because you're in your own body and the fighter, the coach can actually see it kind of unfolding. And it does make sense that if you trust your coach, they can maybe see some things you might not be seeing. Very, very right. true. Speaking about coaching, do you do you tend to corner your teammates a lot? And if so, could you see after you retire uh, doing uh, a lot of coaching or having your own team or your own uh, gym? Um, that's something I've I've actually uh, thought a lot about whether I would actually want to coach and continue to you know, be a part of the sport um, after I'm done fighting. And I think that kind of once you're once you become uh, you know part of this this game, you never really technically fully leave it. Uh, so I could definitely see myself being a coach. Is it a uh, dream that I have a mind to be, you know, the best coach in the world. Um, not right now. My only goal is to be the best fighter in the world. So that's not really something I've thought about. But I do enjoy training people. I love seeing, you know, progress. Um, you know, I like I like teaching what I've learned uh, as a fighter and as a person. Um, but to to say that I like like I like the like to be a coach is is, is kind of a it's hard because. Um, you're not in, you're not in control as an athlete. You know I'm 100 percent in control of what happens. You know in the cage. You know being a coach is frustrating, and it's a, I think it's a harder job maybe even sometimes than being an athlete because you know you can teach someone to do something a million times and they go on the cage and they do something completely different. It's super frustrating. And, you know if it costs them it costs them a fight. You need to find a delicate balance between you know absolutely crushing their ego and you know, teaching them. So yeah, uh, and I've just never mastered that. Uh, that ability you know i'm just uh I'm too too big of an asshole to uh right. to being a coach at this yeah. point in my life absolutely and that's okay because you're still young and in your prime in your career you know and, and down the line maybe yeah. that could come that would be an interesting thing though is is that to be an elite level fighter like yourself 
and then to be in the in the corner of some people down the line let's say after you've retired you know that are that are not as good as you were you know that's got to right. be you know that would be kind of tough cuz you know what they should have done you know what right. they could have done but you see that they just can't do it or, or or couldn't do it. So yeah, I guess that presents an interesting challenge because you have to see, is it maybe they need more time in the gym? Do they need to get in better condition? Do they need to show up at their jiu-jitsu classes more? If like, you notice, though, for the most part, the best coaches in the world weren't the greatest athletes. I think they're the people that are, are so cerebral that, um, and maybe they weren't just great, they weren't just great, they didn't have great natural athletic ability, but they understood things to a level that uh, you know maybe was so much further than what they're you know they're athletically capable of. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of what makes a great coach. I think if you're if you're you just not gonna have your cake and eat it too. You're not gonna be a, a super gifted athlete that understands absolutely every aspect of, of MMA and can teach it extremely well. Right. Um, you know you just really don't see that. You see guys that can execute uh, you know a game plan to to great abilities, but you know. It, when it comes to that, it, you know, putting it on paper and showing somebody that they really struggle with that. Yeah, that's um, true. D you know, teaching it and doing it are two different things. That makes sense. You're right. A lot of the coaches weren't great fighters, but they were just like amazing coaches. But uh, mm -hmm. you never know. Who knows? If that turns out to be something that presents itself, maybe you could be the first. You could be a UFC yeah. champion and then a top coach of UFC champions. That would awesome. Love to be awesome. Love to That'd see it. Something. Definitely. Hey, we've got about five minutes left. I want to go over a couple of things with you. One, I wanted to point out that your observation was right about Khabib. I know you're a huge fan of his, as you mentioned, and he's an amazing fighter. The one fight where someone stopped the takedowns was early in his career, and I think it was either his first or second UFC fight, and he fought uh, Glayson Tebow before Glacen USADA, Tebow. and that was before USADA. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember, but Tebow, every time Joe Rogan would see him, he'd say, how the hell is this guy a lightweight? I mean, yeah. he'd say, this guy... I, I trained yeah. with him. You did you? I trained with him. Oh, he's, wow. He's, he's uh, probably a, a really solid, lean, 185 pounds. I have absolutely no idea how he ever made weight. It's no tough. No idea, because he is a large... I mean, yeah. I, to, to, for me to train with him, I literally thought they were a 40-pound... You know, they're probably... A, yeah. Probably might even have been a 40-pound difference. I mean, he's just so much physically bigger than me, and the, uh, the guy is a freak. Yeah, athlete. He's crazy strong. Yeah, I mean, he's picking me up, throwing me around like a rag doll. Um, that's definitely experience. Uh, that's not to say I didn't get a couple of licks in. Oh, one, I'm but, sure. Uh, yeah, he's a he's a big strong dude. Absolutely. And yeah, I just you know to to go back to Khabib, like I just don't think that um, there's only there's only a handful of guys right now. I think in the world, I don't think there's one guy in the world right now that has the capability of beating him. Right. Um, I think the, there's a couple guys that if they develop a little bit more, they could. Yep. Uh, they could potentially beat him. Um, I'm pretty interested to see this uh, uh, Kevin Lee fight, how that plays out. Yes. Um, uh, who's, what's the name of his opponent? Gregor Gillespie. We were just talking Gillespie. about Gillespie. I yeah. think uh, you know those those are two guys that uh, I, I think you know Gillespie or, or Lee. You know Lee being a great wrestler, having a great wrestling background, right? And having a, such a long reach. Yep. Um, he could give he could give uh, could be problems. Um, and Pop. Gillespie, you know, being such a great wrestler and being such a great athlete, he could, could be problems too. Absolutely. Those are two guys that I think that maybe you could beat him. And then the only other guy that could maybe catch him is, is Tony Ferguson. You know, yes. they, they match they match up evenly, evenly well, you know, as far as, uh, you know, cardio goes. But honestly, I think it's going to be more of the same. I don't think, I think the only difference between Tony and everyone else that could be his fault is that Tony's going to try to throw submissions up on Khabib and submit him and, Get him in some funky stuff on the ground. I just don't think it's going to matter much. I think Khabib's just going to do what Khabib does, and he's going to ball him on the ground. Yeah, you could be right. Although since Tony, you know, spent time in Michigan, I think he went to college. I think in Michigan. He's I, from Michigan. Yes, he's from Muskegon, Michigan. Had a feeling. Yeah, he's, he's a Michigan native. Yep. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about it much, which is unfortunate. Which, uh, isn't cool, but um, yeah, he's a Michigan native. We actually grew up about 20 minutes from each other. Nice, nice. So then, yep. you know, I will cheer for him against Khabib because he's a Michigander. But anyway, man, in your future, hopefully after this win over Yadong, you know, you've got Aljamain Sterling out there. You've got Henry Cejudo. I don't think you're far away, man. And, and I just think that the, a great win coming up here in our nation's capital is going to take you there. And I'm excited to see uh, you getting better and better. And so we are talking about December the... 7th? 7th, yes, 7th. Sir. And Washington, D.C., 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to miss it. Cody Stamen from Michigan, one of the best athletes, amazing fighter, a nice, nice guy, and uh, really well thought out person and uh, someone you can cheer for. He's a he's someone I'm cheering for, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, Cody Stamen's song Yadong coming up on December 7th in Washington, D.C. in the UFC. Cody, thank you so much, man, for taking time out of your schedule of to join us here. Man, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to you, and uh, I'll be cheering for you loudly, as you know us Michiganders always do. Awesome. I appreciate it. appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for the kind words. My pleasure. Have a great night, my friend. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. And that was Mr. Wonderful Cody Stamen. Really, really good guy. Looking forward to him against Song Yadong. Like I said... Uh, we will be seeing him knock out a song.